we're talking about rotating an object around some axis. Uh, we no longer can talk about just its mass for how much torque we're going to have to apply to achieve some angular acceleration. We have to deal with the distribution of mass, because mass that lives further away from the uh, axis of rotation, whichever axis of rotate, whatever axis you're trying to rotate around, uh, mass that lives further away, some distance r, is going to require more torque to get going. So we can't just talk about mass. Instead, we have to talk about something called moment of inertia. Now, moment of inertia is a measurement of the rotational inertia of an object, how hard it is to get something going, and once it's already spinning, how much does it want to keep on going? If you want to think of it as the rotational version of mass, you can. Now, uh, moment of inertia is if you add up all of the mass, uh, all the masses, and multiply them times the distance away from the axis of rotation squared. Now this is very easy if it's a bunch of point masses. You add up each point mass's mass times the distance away from uh, the rotational axis squared. If it's a continuous object, whether it's a rod or a sphere or something else, we're going to do a rod, uh, then you have the integral because you have an infinite number of mass chunks, if you will, dm, and each of those mass chunks has some distance away from whatever axis you're talking about, uh, you know, whatever distance away squared. Um, units for this, kilograms meters squared, kilograms times meters squared, be careful that's not a per because not divided by, uh, and you can see that from this equation here. Another very useful thing you will find is the parallel axis theorem. What the parallel axis theorem says is if you know the moment of inertia of any object through the center of mass, and you want to know what is the moment of inertia uh, for that same object just being rotated around a different yet parallel axis. Maybe we're talking about the end of the rod instead of through the center of mass. You're going to send the rod all the way around. You can simply use this equation. Instead of having to go back through the entire process again, it's just going to be the center of mass. Uh, it's going to be the uh, rotational uh, moment of inertia at the center of mass plus the total mass times the distance between the two axes, between the uh, rotational axis at the center of mass and the new rotational axis you're trying to examine. Let's now solve a couple problems using point masses. Here in the first one, I have two point masses, both of mass m, separated by a length l by a massless rod connecting them. And we're going to start out spinning them around uh, the axis of rotation a, which is located perfectly in the middle. So it's located at the center of mass because it's exactly in the middle of l and these two masses are the same. So we're going to solve for what is their rotational inertia there. Now at A, we know the equation for rotational inertia for anywhere, sum of the masses times the distance uh, between those mass, or the distance from the mass to the axis of rotation squared. So I need to look at what distance each mass is away. Now if I call the axis of rotation a zero here, that means that the mass to the left would be negative L over 2 because it's half of L, and to the right it would be L over 2 because it's actually on the positive side there. So from negative L, negative L over two, 2 for the first one, positive L over 2 for the second one, which then allows me to start substituting into my equation. So you can see here, I took the mass, right, this first mass here, mass m, uh, and then the distance to the axis of rotation, negative l over 2 squared. And that's added to the second mass, right, uh, the second mass's uh, moment of inertia, how much it's contributing to it, and that's its mass, mass m once again, times its distance away, positive l over 2 squared. Now it's just simple algebra. Now in this case you can see I have two of the exact same thing, so I'm going to add them together and put a 2 in front. So now you see I have a 2 in the numerator and a 4 in the denominator, so I can turn that into a 1 half. I come out with 1 half ml squared, pardon my mistake here, I did not square my l's like I should have, so let me go back and correct that. So the moment of inertia for this system of some mass m, and this could have been done with numbers, I just chose to do it with letters here, um, mass m and length l rotating about the center of mass, the moment of inertia for this system rotating around would be 1 half ml squared. Now let's actually solve for B. What if we were to rotate this entire thing around B instead of around the center of mass? So it's not spinning here, but the entire thing spins around uh, on one end. Now we have a choice. We could either go back through the process, and that process isn't overly difficult, or we could use parallel axis theorem, which is what I want to use to try to demonstrate that. 
So there's my parallel axis equation, and I already know the uh, uh, moment of inertia at the center of mass. In fact, if you have to pick a spot, if, if you're not told exactly where to calculate the moment of inertia at first, at the beginning of the problem, calculate it at the center of mass, because then you can do any parallel axis easily using parallel axis theorem. So I know now the moment of inertia at the center of mass. This is for total mass here, which would be 2m, and then the distance between them, you know, between the center of mass and where I'm rotating around is L over 2. So always make sure that you're using total mass here in this part of the equation, and also always check this distance is the distance between the center of mass axis of rotation and the new parallel axis that you're choosing to rotate it around. Now this is, once again, just simple algebra. Once again, that leaves me with a 2 in the numerator and a 4 in the denominator. And then 1 half ml squared plus 1 half ml squared is just ml squared would be my uh, moment of inertia around the end here found in B. Now, this all seems well and good whenever we're dealing with what seems like a very straightforward problem. Two point masses, right, all in a nice line. What happens whenever we throw in more than two point masses and let's make them two-dimensional? So let's have four point masses, all of mass m. Uh, let's put them in a square, all separated by length l, and let's rotate them around an axis here at the very center, all right? So uh, this, this is running through the center of mass and we're going to rotate around like that. What is the moment of inertia of this entire system? where it spins. Well, whenever you're working these problems, one of the first things you want to do is figure out what each mass's distance is to the axis of rotation. And each mass has a distance to the axis of rotation of L over 2. This one's L over 2, and this one's L over 2 also. These type of problems do not require that you have an, that you break things into components or whatever, because, because you're not looking at distances between them. You're looking at just straight line distances to the axis of rotation. Now, once again, I'm going to call to the left negative and to the, po and to the right positive, things that are to the right positive, where my zero line is the axis of rotation, according to this picture here. Uh, and now I have four masses, right, all of mass m, and all of a distance to the axis of rotation of either negative L over 2 or L over 2. And that's going to allow me to solve for what this moment of inertia is. And I apologize for running out of room there, but now I have all four of my masses. This mass here, uh, negative L over 2 away from the axis direct line. This mass over here, positive L over 2 away. Uh, once again, this mass down here now is negative L over 2. It doesn't matter that they're at different locations compared to the axis of rotation. All that matters is their distance to the axis of rotation. Think torque. All that matters is the radius to the spot that it's spinning around. Uh, and then, of course, this mass over here, distance L over 2. Once again, now, basic algebra. Now, as you can see, I have four m l squared over 4s, and so I can combine those. And of course then the two fours would cancel out, leaving me with just m l squared for my moment of inertia. The next problem that I want to do is to try to find the moment of inertia of a uniform, and that is critical here, uniform thin rod, about two points. We're first going to do the center of mass axis in the very middle of the rod, and then we'll do an axis at the very end of the rod uh, and see how those work. Now this is a little bit different, right, because we have a even distribute, uh, we, we are distributing mass all throughout the rod, not just at the ends, but all the way in, and so we're going to actually have to use the integral form r squared dm to uh, solve for what distribution we have. Now, since this is uniform, we don't have to worry about some sort of equation like we did with center of mass, but the, the way this problem works is very, very similar. Notice the issues that we have here. We have the integral, and this is a distance unit, r squared, that would be distance away from, uh, distance away from the axis of rotation, and then dm, or uh, change in mass, a mass chunk, if you will. So this equation is saying, hey, add up all the mass chunks, dm, uh, that are all, and times all their distances away, squared, r squared away. But, but whenever I'm taking my integral, I have two different competing ideas here. I need to simplify them down. I need to get dm in terms of r, and so we have to go back uh, to the linear density, something that we have already learned. Now, for a uniform rod, linear density is the total mass divided by the total length, and each mass chunk has that exact same linear density. 
uh, total mass divided by total length, if it was something different, it wouldn't just be mass divided by length. We, we would have to have an equation to go with that. And that's something that you did with center of mass. But here we're dealing with uniform. Uh, and for that individual mass chunk right here, if we're not talking about, hey, let's look at everything holistically, if we're talking about, hey, uh, forget that it's uniform, but what about this individual mass chunk here? What would be the linear density for that exact moment? Well, that is going to be, uh, you're going to have dm, divided by dr, dr being the width, a very small width of this very small mass chunk. Now you can see what we can do is we can set these two equal to each other. Uh, in the center of mass, it wasn't a big deal to plug lambda in, and so you just multiply dr over and have that in terms of lambda over here because it would cancel out. But that, that's not the case uh, in, in this problem. There is nothing down here in the denominator that would cancel that out. So we actually need to substitute what the linear density is in the linear density, so I'm substituting in here, uh, the linear density is m over l, uh, and that would be the constant, whatever the mass is divided by the length, equals dm dr. Now multiply dr over to the other side, uh, and you get what dm is equal to. Now that will allow me to substitute into my equation over here to uh, align my r's and my m's into, into one thing. Now notice m and l are constants, m being the mass of the entire rod, total mass, and l being the total length, and that's just a number. Those are just constants. This would be your lambda, if you will, uh, or, or the constant for the uniform thin rod, where my variable is r and my variable I'm integrating by is dr also. So what am I going to integrate through? Well, if my a here is the axis of rotation at the center of mass and the entire rod is length l, my mass chunks start over here at negative l over 2, half of the length right on this side, half of the length on that side, so this side negative, negative L over 2, and run all the way past 0 to L over 2. Whenever I take the integral, the square goes up to a cube, and then I have to put a 1 third out in front or send the 3 down to the denominator. Nothing happens to the ML, they're constants. And now I'm ready to evaluate between my endpoints. Now I'm going to deal with the cube. This will be L cubed and then 2 cubed. And negative L cubed is also going to turn out negative. This isn't squared cubed, so that'll turn out negative. And then once again, my 2 cubed. As you can see now, I have 1 third and L cubed over 8, so I can combine my denominators here, multiply my denominators. Also, I've got an L cubed in the numerator on both of them and an L in the denominator, so I can cancel one of those out to get an L squared. Now I can combine like terms. Notice I am minusing a negative, so that means add. So as you can see, whenever we're all done here, right, 2, time, uh, two in the numerator, 24 in the denominator gives me 12, and then I pulled out my 1 12th. Uh, out, out in front here, leaving me 1 12th L squared M would be the moment of inertia for a thin uniform rod being spun about uh, its uh, center of mass, that axis there. Uh, my next question that I have up here is, all right, that's nice. How can, let's solve now for B. What's going to happen over here at B? What, what will be the center of mass there? And you might think to yourself, oh man, that means we have to go through all the integration again. No, A, the integration really isn't that hard, but you actually don't. You can use parallel axis theorem. Parallel axis theorem says if you know the moment of inertia at the center of mass here, then you can quickly and easily find the moment of inertia at any axis parallel to it. And since we're solving for uh, the moment of inertia, uh, for an axis of rotation perfectly uh, parallel to the axis of rotation around the center of mass, I, I, can, I can use that equation. And I know the moment of inertia at the center of mass. I know the total mass of this rod. It's, we're calling it m. We're not using numbers, using letters. And I know the distance between the two axes, if you will. Here's the center of mass. Here's b. And since the center of mass is at the very middle, the distance between them here is l over 2. So I substituted in the center of mass, the moment of inertia rotating about the center of mass that we already calculated, and then here, total mass and the distance between the axis squared. Now it's just algebra. Now I'm going to pull my one-fourth out in front to try to, to try to help us see that these are actually the same terms, rearrange my L squared and my M to see that these are the same terms, they can easily be combined. So I got common denominators for combining my like term. 
And after I combine, I come out with one third L squared M, or if you want to rearrange this commonly, we write the M first, M L squared, uh, for my uh, for my moment of uh, for my moment of inertia rotating about an axis at the end. Notice that whenever we rotate at the end, we actually have a higher moment of inertia than if we rotate about the center of mass, because now mass isn't distributed evenly. Uh, in fact, some of the mass chunks have a lot a larger radius over there. But parallel axis theorem makes it after you find the uh, moment of inertia about the center of mass it makes it very, very easy to find the moment of inertia about it, almost any other point as long as it's a principal axis and it's parallel.